So we're going to continue our discussion of uh, the characterization of Andy and Red. So Andy Dufresne is described um, as a different type of person than the regular prisoner. And we get a sense of his personality when Red describes him on page 21. And he says, I knew him for close to 30 years and I can tell you he was the most self-possessed man I've ever known. What was right with him, he'd only give you a little at a time. What was wrong with him, he kept bottle up inside. If he ever had a dark night of the soul, as some writer or other has called it, you would never know. He was the type of man who, if he had decided to commit suicide, would do it without leaving a note, but not until his affairs had been put neatly in order. If he had cried on the witness stand, or if his voice had thickened and grown hesitant, even if he had started yelling at that Washington-bound district, district attorney, I don't believe he would have gotten the life sentence he wound up with. Even if he had of, he would have been out on parole in 1954, but he told his story like a recording machine, seeming to say to the jury, this is it, take it or leave it, they left it. So the first impression that uh, Red has of Andy and the jury has of Andy uh, while they're convicting him is the fact that he is so uh, sort of emotionally distant and he's very self-possessed, is what Andy or er, Red calls Andy, uh, meaning that he has sort of uh, very sort of cool, composed exterior, and keeps all his feelings on the inside. Within amongst the other prisoners, Andy also has a, a different kind of reputation uh, from the other men. On page 27, near the bottom, uh, Red talks about Andy's reputation. Um, here we go. Uh, it was on the Sunday that Andy first came to me. I had just finished talking to Elmore Armitage, a fellow who often came in handy to me about a radio when Andy walked up. I knew who he was, of course. He had a reputation for being a snob and a cold fish. People were saying he was marked for trouble already. Uh, one of the people saying so was Boggs Diamond, a bad man to have on your case. Andy had no cellmate, and I heard that's just the way he wanted it. Although people were already saying he thought his shit smelled sweeter than the ordinary. But I don't have to listen to rumors about a man who I can judge him for myself. So Andy seems to have this reputation as being a sort of snob, a cold fish, so cold, distance, not sort of interacting with the other prisoners, keeping his distance. And then he's already being marked for trouble, right? This Boggs Diamond is uh, going to target Andy as his victim. So immediately our first impression of Andy is that he is somewhat dif dif different than the other prisoners. And uh, he stands out. We can also think about the circumstances surrounding Andy's trial. Um, there was no, at the time, no DNA evidence or anything like that. This was pre-DNA. Uh, so we have just sort of circumstantial evidence that's used to convict Andy of his crime. And it seems as if uh, there's just a lot of sort of bad luck surrounding Andy at this time in his life and he gets pinned with this crime even though he claims he's innocent and uh, we eventually learn that he is innocent of uh, this crime. Uh, the circumstances, he was a well-to-do banker and uh, married to a beautiful uh, girl uh, who was having an affair with a local sports figure and then both his wife and uh, the sports figure were found murdered, and then the murders were uh, seen as, or Andy was sort of convicted of these murders. So it was somewhat of a scandalous, sensationalist uh, circumstance, and there's a lot of sort of newspaper scandal that was being sort of pushed around. And uh, there's also the matter of the prosecutor, uh, the DA, uh, district attorney who had political aspirations, they say. And he sort of made uh, this, used this as a sort of platform to promote his political career. 
so he really wanted a conviction. And then there was a lot of sort of just circumstantial evidence, uh, people, the hearsay, and like um, eyewitnesses sort of test their testimony sort of confirmed that Andy was very drunk that night and he seemed very sort of um, angry and capable of some violence. Um, but at the same time, there is this idea that memory is subjective, right? So people can be sort of um, bribed into their testimony or they can, again, uh, remember things based on their own sort of subjective viewpoint. Uh, so again, uh, testimony is not necessarily uh, enough proof in this case, uh, although the jury were very much convinced of Andy's guilt based on his own presence in the courtroom, the fact that he was so emotionless, like he had no emotional reaction at all when he was being questioned and seemed very cold. Uh, this is what convicted him uh, in the eyes of the jury. And this is what uh, eventually sort of got him sent to prison. So there is a lot of violence and different types of violence that are depicted in the film and in the novella. Um, in the film version, if you are watching it, there is a sort of um, quite a graphic scene at the start of the film when Byron Hadley, who is the head guard, drags out an inmate and beats him in front of all the other inmates um, and this is sort of used as a intimidation and the threat of punishment for the others to learn not to uh, question the authority of the guards and the warden. Uh, as soon as the men enter the prison environment they are supposed to sort of uh, give up their own sense of self and conform to the norms of uh, this power structure of the prison and become part of this institution. So this act of violence uh, from the guards and the warden, uh, this has a way of sort of punishing the men but it's also a way to sort of teach them to follow the established order of the prison hierarchy and uh, respect those rules. In many ways, the prison itself seems more like a just a sort of institution that enforces punishment rather than that other idea of rehabilitation that Red mentions um, in the opening, uh, opening of the book. Um, so there is a sort of idea that a prison should be a place where you get rehabilitated and eventually re-enter the world outside the prison as a productive, valued citizen, an individual who can achieve things in life. But it seems as if Shawshank Prison is one, uh, a prison that sort of takes your life, right? It takes the best part of your life and leaves you sort of the shell of a man at the end of it. Uh, so it's not teaching you to become a better person, it's just teaching you to follow the rules and uh, stripping you of any sense of individuality or uh, freedom to think and feel differently than how you're uh, sort of supposed to feel. So just to sort of follow the established order. And when we think about uh, violence within the prison itself. It's not just the guards uh, enforcing their power over the prisoners, it's also the prisoners uh, finding or establishing their own sort of sense of hierarchy uh, based on um, their reputation. Uh, so Andy is immediately victimized uh, and viewed as sort of a prey, uh, as weak, by Boggs, Diamond, and the sisters. And this is when he sort of experiences the most brutal physical 
uh, hardship within his time at Shawshank Redemption or Shawshank Prison. So Andy is uh, the sort of target of Boggs, Diamond, and the sisters. And Red explains their presence within the prison on pages 32 and 33. And these men are ones who sort of gang together and uh, commit sexual violence against uh, whoever they feel is sort of weak or vulnerable. And he explains uh, that it's not based on sort of sexual desire, right? It's even though, you know, sexual frustration is probably a motivating factor within the tension that builds in a prison environment when you just have men around. Uh, but this is more about power, I think, uh, and feeling sort of powerful when you, as a prisoner, are somewhat hopeless or, uh, again, powerless in a way. Uh, so I'll just read you the description on page 32. So they are, the sisters, they are to prison, they are to prison society what the rapist is to society outside the walls. They're usually long timers doing hard bullets for brutal crimes. Their prey is the young, the weak, and the inexperienced. Or, as in the case of Andy Dufresne, the weak looking. Their hunting grounds are the showers, the cramped tunnel-like area way between the industrial washers and the laundry sometimes the infirmary. On more than one occasion, rape has occurred in the closet-sized projection booth behind the auditorium. Most often, what the sisters take by force, they could have had for free, if they wanted it that way. Those who have been turned away, turned, always seem to have crushes on one sister or another, like teenage girls with their Sinatras, Presleys, or Redfords. But for the sisters, the joy has always been in taking it by force, and I guess it will always, it always will be. Because of his small size and fair good looks, and maybe also because of that very quality of self-possession I, I had admired, the sisters were after Andy from the day he walked in. So Andy is targeted because of his sort of uh, sense of self-possession, uh, Red says, his small size and fair good looks. So because he is sort of, he's not broken down yet, he has that sense of self, uh, he is targeted by these men who want to sort of break his spirit and take him by force. So he becomes the victim of uh, Boggs and the other prisoners. And he is repeatedly uh, gang raped by the sisters and Boggs Simon in particular. And Red acknowledges that this is just one part of the prison life that uh, has not changed. He says, prison is no fairy tale world. But I think we can learn or learn a little bit about Andy's character uh, by how he uh, faces this obstacle. Uh, so on page 34, his attitude... Um, is sort of clearly established. So it says, Andy went through that alone, the way he went through everything alone in those days. He must have come to the conclusion that others before him had come to, namely, that there are only two ways to deal with the sisters, fight them and get taken, or just get taken. He decided to fight. So it seems as if Andy, when faced with obstacles, adversity, such as physical, sexual violence, he decides to fight back, right? Um, even if he doesn't always successfully stop this assault from happening, he doesn't continue to, he never gives up or gives in. He is a determined person and we learn that he is uh, going to fight for his sense of freedom. Um, and then he also uses his intelligence. So there's this scene where uh, Boggs is sort of threatening him and then Andy uses his intelligence to get out of that situation. Um, all, even though they do beat him severely. And then eventually Andy uh, also uses his intelligence. He has money stored away and he's used this to, able to use this to bribe the guards who eventually will beat Boggs and uh, curb some of the prison violence.